Christ, the God who saves, for all he has done, for all he is, we'll sing aloud in praise to him. Let every tribe and every tongue bless your name. Let your church in Africa resound with praise. Praise to our Africa's King. Praise to our God who reigns. Let the people come and dance before you stand up and isn't it just amazing we are all unveiled and you can go and look at somebody and just say how beautiful their smile is how their denture work is just amazing but no seriously give them big hugs and just celebrate that we can see each other face to face today
Good morning to everybody joining us on our live stream. Welcome to you and may you just know that God is so near and so close this morning as we worship together. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just are so grateful that we can be here just knowing that you come to, to meet with us when we are joined together in your name. Father, just as in the physical, we can see each other. Lord, I just pray this morning that there'd be a release of your spirit, that we'd see something fresh of your love for us, that we'd see something fresh about those whispers that we may not have heard for a while. Just thank you for your presence even now. Just praise Him with everything we have. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Oh 
the sound, hear the sound of hearts returning to you, return to you, sing your kingdom, broken lives are made new, you make us you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away.
descended to the world he made. The ages rock of ages in a manger lay. Behold the world that bore our flesh. The heart of God inside an infant's chest. incarnate in the virgin's hands, the radiance of the Father in the Son of Man. Behold the peace that pierced the night, the hope of nations in a baby's cry.
sense this word is specific it's a specific word for someone it might be more than one person but I, I feel very strongly that there's somebody here specifically who has been waiting for a sign from God and God says stop looking for that sign I am here come to me walk in my ways walk in obedience in the path that I have set before you and I will open the way so that you may walk in it and know me as your Father God. Yes. Just want to take a moment now. Just silence ourselves. Perhaps that word is for one person, perhaps for many people here today. So telling in that song as well, Emmanuel, God with us. If you are that person here this morning, He is with you in the midst of your circumstance. He is with you right now in this hall. He's with you, present with you in your family as well. Every step that you might take, He is with you. So let's respond to that word by just taking a moment now to acknowledge that God is indeed with us now. Mountains are still be. Strongholds are still being used. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still.
mountains, mountains are still being loosed. The roads are still being loosed. Yes, right here, right now. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still. Bodies are still being raised. anything. Nothing is too far, nothing is too deep, nothing is too high for you, nothing is too wide for you. Thank you for just us knowing that. Praise you, Lord. everyone who uh, are praying for their prodigals I had a sense of the Lord saying he's whistling for all our prodigals so we can give him praise and glory uh, for that word so Father we just want to say thank you thank you Lord that your word declares that you are whistling for our prodigals they're coming home Lord they're coming home and we rejoice in that, in Jesus' name, amen. You can read that, by the way, in Zechariah 8.10. Thank you, Lord, that nothing is impossible for you. We bring those back. Andre, just maybe a last part of that, please. Just acknowledge this, that God is on the move and He's able to do anything. Let's give Him praise.
praise today. Let's respond to the Father whistling over our prodigals. Come on. Let's do a whistle. Who can whistle? Come on. I can't whistle. <laughs> Let's whistle them in. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing and just bringing the prodigals in. Jesus' name. Amen. Also from my side, it is really good to see some faces this morning, and not half faces, so it's really good to have all of you here, welcome. Right, just to be able to know what's going on in and around um, El Shaddai Church, please um, direct your attention to the screens for some information. Good morning everyone, it's great to have you all in the ESCC Hall with us this morning, and if it's your first time worshipping with us today, please come to the info desk after the service. You'll find it on the left-hand side in the foyer on your way out. We want to spoil you with a voucher for a drink at Streams Cafe. We can also tell you a bit more about us and show you different ways of how you can connect in with us. If you've connected with us online, either during our live streaming or later on, a very warm welcome to you too, wherever you may be connecting from. We want to tell you about two great workshops that Twilby and Sunel from Crosspoint Family Consultants are facilitating in the next few weeks. The Grandparents Blessing Workshop teaches grandparents the value of their influence in a grandchild's life. It'll equip grandparents to support and encourage their own children in raising their children. This workshop is useful to grandparents with grandchildren at any age. It's especially beneficial for grandparents of children nearing or going through puberty. There are two dates to choose from, Friday the 1st of July or Sunday the 17th of July. The Parents Blessing Workshop is also happening on Sunday the 24th of July. This workshop teaches parents how to support and encourage children of any age in God's identity and destiny from conception to their wedding day. We'll remind you again nearer the time about this workshop, but with the school holidays coming up, we just wanted to give you a heads up. The registration and cost details for both these seminars are on the ESCC website. Talking about school holidays, we want to take the pressure off our cell group leaders over the holiday, so there will be no formal cell meetings and guidelines for the next three weeks. However, we do encourage the cell groups to keep in touch, connect in different ways and use the time to do some fun social events together. Streams Cafe is also taking a short break. You only have to do without your favorite drink for two Sundays, though. Streams will be open again on Sunday, the 17th of July. Children, don't forget about the Ice Adventure Holiday Club. It runs from the 4th to the 8th of July. There's still time to sign up and take part in this excellent holiday club, so sign up today at www.escc.co.za. And lastly, we want to honor those who faithfully give of their tithes and offerings every single month. Most people do this via EFT nowadays, which is our preferred choice. But if you don't have our banking details, you'll find them on our website. Look for the Give Push button on the home page or for the Give tab at the top of the page. However, if you prefer to give cash, there will be a box on the stage after the service that you can make use of. Have a wonderful week. Great, right, there we go. Lots happening, even though it's holidays. Um, I'd, I've got the privilege of sharing with you word from God this morning, and um, um, you got all the, got the little thing that says, keeping keep in, in step. And uh, it says there with Tobi Ferreira, but please don't, don't keep in step with me, all right? That's not the idea. 
And you hear what I'm saying today, keep in step with the Spirit. That's what I want to talk about this morning. But that's the, the, the theme. What I want to start off with is tell you just a little bit something that will put this maybe in perspective. When I was in high school many, many moons ago, um, we had this, this group of students that we had a uniform, we had a beret and everything. I'm not sure what you call that in English. In Afrikaans, it was gepraat van cadette. I'm not sure if it's cadets. Is that a, okay. When you Google cadets, it comes up as Girl Scouts or something like that. But anyway, I was not part of that. Um, but we had, okay, so let's go with cadets um, because I thought that might be the right word. So it was a group of about 30 or 40 of us that would practice three times a week marching and doing some kind of movements as a group and so on. Um, and it was, it was really very strict. There was someone that, that shouted the instructions and we would then follow that halt and march or whatever, right turn and so on. There was one particular move that we, that we made that was really interesting and was really difficult to get right. And that was when the whole block, the whole squad of cadets would turn like this on a hinge on the inside. So it was not like everyone just turned like that. It was turning the whole group like in a circle, moving like that. And the reason why it was difficult because you had to stay in formation. And that mean, meant that um, you had to be really aware of where the others around you were. So what we used to do is we did this. We put our hands out like that, the right hand, and then we looked back like that so we can only see one head. And as you walk, you only keep seeing one head. If you see two, you know you're, you're out of place. You need to adjust. And the interesting one, the thing is that the person on the inside where the hinge takes place, he does this. He's not putting up his hand because he's got no one on this side, but he just, he just goes like this. And he, until he's turned 90 degrees. But on that side, it's a whole different story. On that side, it's taking big steps and just keeping your eye on the line. Keeping in step was so important when we did those maneuvers and things like that. Now, I want to share with you a word from Galatians 5. This is Paul talking to the, writing to the, the church in Galatia. And he says this in verse 16, from verse 16 to 26. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. I love how Paul Put it here in verse 25 that we should keep in step with the Spirit. And that is what I would like to focus on in this message and also why I started with the illustration of a marching squad that keeps in step with each other. First half of this chapter 5, Paul deals with the following. He talks about our freedom in Christ, that we have been set free by Christ from the yoke of slavery and from the law and the effects of the law. But then he says this, you are free, but don't misuse your freedom to keep on sinning. He says, don't misuse it. Don't use that freedom in the wrong way. Tim Keller said the following. He said, freedom is not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right restrictions. Can I read it again? Freedom is not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right restrictions. So there's things that we need that are right that restrict us, and within that, 
we have freedom. If you look on the screen, you'll see an image of a soccer field come up. And that soccer field has got lines around it. That is what defines it as a soccer field with some goalposts at the ends. Now, the thing is that there's rules. There are rules in soccer. And part of those rules are that there are boundaries. And within those lines, you play soccer and you enjoy yourself and you do whatever you can. You use whatever skills you've got. Without the lines... Ronaldo would keep on dribbling the ball. I mean, he would just go forever. But there are boundaries, and once the ball crosses the boundaries, the whistle goes, everything stops, and they have a restart, right? Same with rugby, all those kind of things. So there are rules, though, there are right restrictions in place to give some guidelines and to give a framework of where we can operate and what we can do. It is the same in our lives. God gives us restrictions, and within those restrictions, we have freedom. So freedom is not for God to take away everything and say, all right, go for it. Anything is okay. No, there's some restrictions that he puts in place, and inside of that, we have freedom. Now, Paul wrote about those restrictions in this passage, and he mainly looks at three things. The first one is a call or urgent plea that he makes. The second one is is a warning that he gives, and the third one is a challenge that he puts to the church in Galatia. And we're going to look at that a bit closer. The first one is Paul that calls or gives an urgent plea to the church in Galatia. And um, we read that in verse 16 and 17 of this passage. So let's just quickly read that again so it's fresh in our minds. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from from doing the things that you want to do. So first of all, Paul calls the believers in Galatia to walk by the Spirit. Why? Because when as believers we walk by the Spirit, we don't gratify the desires of the flesh. So actually it's one way of Resisting the flesh, of keeping the flesh out of our lives, is to walk by the Spirit. Verse 17 clearly spells out that there is an outright conflict between the Spirit and the flesh, the worldly things in our lives, or the sinful nature that's still operating. Generally, there's not a problem for us to understand the difference or the the tension or the opposition between these two. We understand that the things of the world are not the things of God. We have a good understanding of that. The problem often lies in resisting the flesh or sinful nature and to walk by the Spirit, as Paul commands us here, as Paul tells us to do. And because the two are in conflict with each other, it means that to walk with the one is to not walk with the other. What does it mean? To walk by the Spirit. Paul elaborates a bit on this in verse 18 where he says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So being led by the Spirit is part of walking with the Spirit. And then in verse 25 he says, Let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's what I want to focus on this morning because that is also walking with the Spirit is keeping in step with the Spirit of God. Keeping in sync with Him. All of you know what a three-legged race is, right? Who of you have done that? Yeah. The key thing is to stay in sync, right? Because one of your legs are tied to the other, one of the legs of the other person. And you've got to try and move together, especially with this leg that is now braced together. If you don't, you're going to fall, you're going to get hurt. So it's really very important to coordinate that walk. And that is what it's like walking with the Spirit of God. Keeping in step with the Spirit of God. Keeping in sync with Him is to learn to walk with Him. And here's the most important thing. We are walking with Him. He is not walking with us. So He determines the pace. He determines the gate, how far the step will be. He determines the pace, everything like that. He determines and we fall in with Him. That's crucial for us to understand. 
Now, what does the flesh try and do in our lives? The flesh tries to make us look less like Jesus. What does the Spirit try to do? He tries to get us to imitate Christ and look more like Him. So it's opposites. It's complete opposites from each other. And the result is found at the end of verse 17. The Spirit, the Spirit keeps us from or restrains us from doing the things that we want to naturally do by the flesh. So there we see a battle. That the Spirit helps us. It restrains us from going to that side where the flesh is. Now, again, I'll show you a picture of this. I've learned this from Craig Hill, the founder of Family Foundations. A brilliant little picture that helped me a lot with just understanding how this whole thing works. So if you look on the screen, you'll see a picture come up with, a, with three blocks on it. And it's, it's the battle for the soul. On the one side, on the left-hand side, you've got the flesh, which can be seen as the body or the sinful nature within us. In the middle, you've got the soul, which is the mind, will, and emotions. That's almost like the control center of our lives. And on the right-hand side, you've got the spirit. And that's where the Holy Spirit also resides and the part of us that gets born again when we come to Jesus. That's the part that connects with God. Now, the thing is there... That the soul in the middle is that there's a battlefield for that. And the flesh is trying to get access to that. And the spirit is trying to get access to that because whoever wins at that moment will determine what I decide. Will determine what thoughts will be in my mind, what my will will decide I do, and what I will act out in my life. So on the one side we got the flesh, on the other side we got the spirit in competition with each other or opposing each other. And now you see there's a little door between the flesh and the soul. And if we get the next slide, we'll see there's also a little door between the soul and the spirit. And now, if they'll manage to get this right, we're going to move between the two images. And you'll see that the doors flip open and close. If you can see that. So that means that those doors are mutually exclusive. That means if the one opens, the other one closes. Because they're in opposition to each other. They can't exist in the same space. So when the, f the door to the flesh is open and I allow the fleshly things to come into my soul, fill my mind and, uh, and affect my will and emotions, then the spirit door closes. But when I go to the spirit of God and I open up my spirit to him, the door to the flesh closes. Do you know that we will never be able to shut the door to the flesh by just trying to do that, to try and shut the door to the flesh? It's almost like on autopilot. When it sees there's a need inside the soul, it wants to flood in. So what do we do? We open ourselves regularly to the Spirit because that door is going to close instantaneously. When I open myself up to the Spirit of God and I allow Him to come into my life, when I walk by Him, when I, I'm led by Him, and when I am in step with the Spirit, that door to the flesh is closed. Paul goes on to give the, his readers an accurate picture of that side of the flesh and what that looks like. And uh, he, he mentions a whole uh, number of things here in verse 20, 19 to 20. And the first few things, the first three things he mentions has got to do with purity. He talks about sexual immorality. He talks about impurity. He talks about sensuality. That is lust and excessive focus on sensual pleasures and things like that. The second group has to do with what we worship. Got to do with idolatry got to do with sorcery or witchcraft. The next four has to do with heart problems, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. And then the next four has to do with things that disrupt unity, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. And the last two is actions or behavior, drunkenness or orgies. So that's a, that's a, that's a huge list. It's actually an intimidating list if you think about it, like, Wow, like all these things can come you know, against us and can come to try and infiltrate our lives and so on. But that's the flesh. And it is against the will and desire of the Spirit of God. Furthermore, it falls outside of the boundaries that God has put for life and for blessing in our lives. So Paul here makes an urgent call to the believers in Galatia to give attention to walking by the Spirit and not be led astray by the flesh. To walk by the Spirit is to walk in the rhythm or to the rhythm of the heartbeat of God. That's what the Spirit wants us to do. To walk 
within the heart of God, to walk within His plans, in His purposes for our lives. So that's the first thing that Paul focuses on. The second thing is he warns the believers. He warns them. In verse 21, Paul wrote, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting to note that, that Paul gives them a second warning. He says, I warn you as I've warned you before. So it's possible that maybe they did not heed the first warning he gave and they got involved in these things again. Or maybe it's that Paul realizes the pressure that society and the world is putting on the believers and he says, I warn you again, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that word do is very important for us to understand because in our language it's just do. But if you go back in the Greek language is the word prosur. And that word means one thing only, practice. Those who practice these things, those who repeatedly or habitually are involved in these things, those who routinely live by these things or those who have taken these things on as a way of life, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there are people that don't like this verse. There's even believers who may not even like this verse because I guess people don't like verses that confront them, tells them not to do these things. Many people will question the love of God based on this. The hyper-grace um, theology has got a huge problem with this verse. Huge, huge problem. Because hyper-grace says that God has already forgiven all sins. You just carry on because God has forgiven everything. There's not even a need for confession because God is a loving and a gracious God and He has already made a way to deal with all your sins and you can live as you like because God has got your back. Which is not the truth at all. God has put boundaries in place and there are consequences if we cross the boundaries that God has put in place that give life and that give blessing. It doesn't change his love. It doesn't change his grace. It doesn't change a person's value in his sight. But God has placed boundaries in place. If you think of Adam and Eve, God said, there's all the trees in this garden you can eat from. Eat from all of them. One tree. That's a boundary. That's a restriction God put in place. And that's the one restriction that they crossed. And they took part of that and sent into the world. You also think of, of Jesus when the, the woman was brought to him that was caught in adultery and the, men, the people said to, to Jesus, we caught this woman in the act of adultery and the, the law said that we should stone her to death right now. What do you say? I mean, of course, they wanted to trick him and, and ca catch him out. But Jesus said the following. He said, those of you who are without sin, you pick up the first stone and you throw. And none of them could do that, not even the Pharisees. Because they knew they had sin in their lives. So they turned away and Jesus said the following, and this is grace. Jesus said the following. He looked at her and said, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. That's a restriction. That's grace extended, but there's a, a restriction in place. There's a boundary set immediately. Go, you're forgiven, but do not sin again. Do not continue in that pattern. So if I could put it plainly, uh, Galatians 5.21 in plain language, it says, if anyone, if someone harbors fleshly things, continually sow the seeds of the flesh, indulges in or entertains fleshly things, is caught up in it and has no remorse, show no remorse, have no intention of turning away from it, show no signs of repentance, the Bible says that such a person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the word of God. I cannot change that. No one can change that. It is a boundary set in place for the safety of our, for our safety and we must stay within it. If we want to experience life as God intended, if we want to enjoy life and be blessed in the process. Many years ago, there was something in that would that greatly affected negatively affected my life. 
I was a child of God by then. I had a clear calling of God on my life. I even finished seminary at that stage, did my theological studies. But this thing kept, kept nagging at me. And I, I got confronted with it. It happened that Zanella and I were in the United States for nine months. We stayed there and, and served there and learned there and did some internship. And it was a time that was really interesting because God really worked on us in that time, mainly on me. We were not even married two years at that point. And um, if we look back now, we, we, we always say that that, it was the, that was the time when God really came and turned our lives around, saved our marriage. If it wasn't for those, two, those nine months, I don't think we'll, we would have made it. But saved our marriage and instilled the calling in our hearts for ministry. But we were attending a midweek service in a little town at a Baptist church in a little town in Hernando, Mississippi. Small little rural town kind of place. And we ended up in this service. And I don't know if you've experienced it before yourself, but you sit there and you think, I think God is picking on me. I think, I think am I the only one in the service tonight? <laughs> because it, it comes straight at your heart. It speaks straight to you. It feels like, wow, they, you know, it's not condemnation, it's just conviction that you've got to do something about it. There's no escape. I became so aware of this in my heart, and it was as if God was saying to me and putting his finger on this thing that was in my life and saying to me something like the following, if you continue in this way, if you keep on disregarding this boundary, if you keep on abusing my grace, if you don't ditch this practice, I cannot use you. And in fact, you are quenching and insulting my spirit inside of you. And if you don't repent, I will remove my spirit from you. I went to the front in tears and I prayed with someone and really laid down that thing that was affecting my life and affecting our marriage at that point before the Lord. And I, I repented of it. And I left that church building with such a feeling of relief, just such a, a weight off my shoulders. I repented and forgiveness was instantaneous, but my journey back to where God wanted me to be and where God needed me to be, that was a process. That was a journey. And part of my journey was having a very difficult and a very humbling discussion with my wife, Zanel, about what, was, what God was dealing with in my life a few evenings before that. Another part of the journey was to get in step with the Spirit, to, to just find out how, what is the pace that the Spirit is walking at, and I need to get up to that pace. And then the next part of the journey was to not only get in step with the Spirit, but stay in step with Him, keep in step with Him, keep up with Him. I had to let certain things go. They were things I had to deliberately turn away from. Zanel had to help me in some of those things, and they were things I had to, to learn to turn my back on just bluntly, just turn away from it. I had to be aware of the enemy's tactics and how I need to identify it. I had to break with the practice that had gotten me into that position that I was at that stage. And by God's grace, I did. I managed to do that. But I had to get in step with God's Spirit and learn to walk at His pace and hear His voice on a daily basis. Now, just to remind you that this message is about that vital aspect of life in and through Jesus Christ, which is keeping in step with the Spirit. The problem is that, we, that if we don't guard our hearts, like Solomon says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. If we don't guard our hearts in that way, and if we don't open the door to the Spirit, then our souls would, will get flooded by all the worldly things. Our souls will get flooded, our minds will get clogged with all the things of the world, and we will fall out of step with the Spirit. I've seen this happen in my life, as I've, I've, as I've shared with you briefly now, and I've also seen it in many people's lives through years of ministry. And there's one thing many people don't understand, of how we can easily get out of step with the Spirit, how we can fall out of step with the Spirit. I, you know, in times when we've ministered to people, I've heard the following many times. I sometimes watch movies with sex scenes in it, but I will never live a sexually moral life. I'll never do those things. 
Or I play violent video games where I learn to shoot people and kill them, but I have never and will never pick up a gun and shoot anyone in my life. I don't practice witchcraft. But it's intriguing to me to, le- to, to watch things about that and to read books that, that talk about all these weird kind of stuff that happens. If we consider what Jesus says about that, Romans 12 is to, well, Jesus didn't say this, but Paul wrote this. I'll quote you now what Jesus said. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is the soul part. So just the thought here, if we let all those things come in, how will we be renewed in our minds? That by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Matthew 5.22, this is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. So he's talking about killing people, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus takes it one notch up. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry at his brother, really furious and hates his brother, is liable, will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Never mind murdering the person, but just thinking these things. Having a hatred towards someone. You haven't done the act yet, but Jesus said, even if you think those things, hang on, I've got a problem with that. Matthew 5, 27 to 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, and it goes the other way as well, obviously, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. No coming together, no physical contact, just looking. Just letting those thoughts come in. Just visualizing that which is not supposed to be visualized. Jesus said, it's as if you've already done it. And we, we simply cannot think that we can willingly expose ourselves to the fleshly things of the world and somehow remain immune to it. We cannot open the door to the things that oppose the Spirit of God and think that it will do us no harm. 1 John, 1 John 2 verse 15 to 17 says the following, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, I find a lot of people in our ministry and what we do, find a lot of people struggling with this. And young people are struggling the most with determining where's the boundary between right and wrong. Because it's so merged these days. It's so gray. These days, where's right, where's wrong? What can I do and what can't I do? What is allowable, what is not? I've sat with a number of young people during this lockdown period, spoke with them because their parents asked me to come in because they need help, and sat with them, and some had nightmares, some had anxiety and sat with fear. Some of them saw things in their rooms that was not physically there, but it was there and it was tormenting them. And I would start chatting with them and talking to them and say, tell me a bit about what you do, what you like, and so on. And they would come out with all these movies that's way over their age restriction, the books they read, and I would think, well, I would would tell them, do you think you can expose yourself to these things and it's not going to affect you? Do you think you can watch these things and read this stuff and it's not going to have any effect on your life? Are 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 you really concerned or worried or... Clueless as to why you are struggling to sleep, why you have fear and anxiety, why there's something in your room that keeps you awake. When I was um, maybe about 14 years old, my dad was pastoring a church in Benoni in the East Rand, Gauteng. And there was this, this young man that was in our church, in our youth group, and I knew him very well. When my dad and my mom would go and visit his parents, I would go tag along and spend time in his room. We'll look at his stamp collection, which was quite elaborate and fantastic stamp collection that he had. And he'll play some video games, and I would sit and watch him and think, hmm, this is quite violent, but 
okay? And then one day he, when I was visiting with him, he went, I think he went to the bathroom and I was alone in his room and I just started looking through his shelf and saw some interesting videos and stuff there and I thought, wow, this is like scary stuff. This is like 18 age restriction. This is like all murder stories and all these weird kind of things. And I thought, well, that's, this is, wow. I felt overwhelmed. The reason I'm telling you this is just to say that those things affect one's life. That young man is not a young man anymore, but he's serving life in prison at the moment. He's missed all those years. Since I knew him, until they arrested him. What did they arrest him for? He was known as the Norwood serial rapist and killer. Killed about six or seven girls. Raped them and killed them. And he's serving a life sentence for that. And when I heard that, I couldn't forget the things that I saw. And I thought, did those things affect, it, affect him? In his thoughts, because he opened himself to those things and it started to become reality to him. It started to affect him in such a way that, it, that what he led into his soul started to fill his thoughts, started to become his emotions, and started to become a willful act. And I just realized there the importance of, of keeping our souls in the place where God wants it to be, open to his spirit, not to the worldly things. Because if and when we are in Christ, we are supposed to be dead to sin and our sinful actions. Romans, five, Romans 8 verse 5 to 11 says it so beautifully. For those who, are, who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. It's those two sides. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Galatians 6 verse 8. For, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So it's like sowing seeds. Depends on what we feed, right? You've heard all the, the, that thing of the, the comparison of that you know, if there's two dogs, then the one that you feed the most, it's going to grow the most, it's going to bark the louses, whatever. It's like sowing seeds. If we sow seed here, if we sow bad seed here, it's going to grow into bad stuff. If we sow good seed, it's going to come up. Do you know what I've noticed in, in our little, little garden that we have? I'm not a much of a gardener, but I've observed this, that weeds grow much faster than grass or flowers or shrubs or anything like that. It kind of lines up with what Jesus said, right? Some seed will fall there and then there, and some seed will fall amongst the thorns and things. And those things come up, and it just, it just takes the life out of it because weeds take the sunlight, it takes all the minerals, it takes all the water before the other plants can get to it. And it's kind of a picture of what the flesh does in our lives. If we sow that and we allow those seeds to be planted, it will grow much faster than anything else. Now, Paul contrasts these worldly things that we've had the list of. He contrasts it with what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says this, again, such things, there is no law. There's no restriction. There's no boundary to this. And even incidentally, if you look at at worldly judicial systems, they don't really have a problem with those things. They don't have a problem with someone genuinely loves. They don't have a problem when there's peace promoted, all those kind of things. That's stuff that even the world recognizes. Those are good things. It's good things to have. Let me close the message with the last thing that we see in this passage, and that's Paul giving two challenges to the readers of this of this epistle. The first challenge is in verse 18, but if, and the word if is the challenge, but if you are led by the Spirit, so he's actually challenging and saying, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. 
And the reason he says that is because the law prohibits. The law forbids. The law puts boundaries in place. And the works of the flesh, those are the things that the law is against. So if we are led by the flesh, meaning our sinful nature, we overstep those boundaries where there's a law against and we will carry the consequences of that law. But if we are led by the Spirit of God, we are free from the judgment of the law because we obey and do the things against which there is no law and the law of sin has no hold on us. Challenge number two, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, here's the challenge. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with His Spirit. It seems like Paul is saying that to live by the Spirit is one thing, but to keep in step with the Spirit, that's something really to look out for. That's something different. Living by the Spirit, I believe, is salvation through Jesus Christ, where we live through the Spirit and the power, the resurrection power that the Spirit brings into our lives. We live when we give our lives to Christ. That's the life that comes in us. But keeping in step with the Spirit is walking in sync with Him. Following His promptings and being open to His influence on a daily basis. It's the three-legged race thing. That's what it means to live in step, keep in step with the Spirit. So we need to walk in the Spirit. That means to walk in that resurrection life. We need to be led by the Spirit. That means we open our ears and we listen to Him, open our hearts as well, but also then to keep in step with the Spirit, which means we, live, we let Him live Jesus through us, and we keep in step and in sync with Him. May we be found to be out of step with this world, but in step with the life-giving Spirit of God. May we live to the beat of a different drum. Because there's a lot of drums around in this world telling us to dance like this and walk like that. May we just move to a different beat. May the voice of the Holy Spirit be the metronome that we walk to, causing us to walk to the rhythm of the Father's heartbeat. Father, thank you for just showing us how important it is for us, for us to walk in the Spirit, by the Spirit, but also keep in step with the Spirit. And we, Lord, we are confronted every single day with different beats, different voices, different things, different challenges, different things that try to get our attention, try to draw us away from you, try to infiltrate our souls, fill our thought life and, and affect our will and our emotions and things, temptations that come each day. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will move in such a way in us that we will daily come to you, daily just open ourselves to your influence in our lives, that we will ask you to fill us daily with your presence so that we will every day be able to walk with you be led by you, and be in step with you to the glory of God our Father. In Jesus' name. Life descend to the world he made. The ages rock of ages in a manger laid. Behold the word that bore our flesh. The heart of God inside an infant's chest. The infinite incarnate. of the Father in the Son of Man. Behold the peace that pierced the night. The hope of nations in the baby's cry.
such a hope because you are here with us to dwell with us as we make choices to step with you daily in Jesus name bless you Lord Amen have a wonderful week everybody enjoy just stepping with the spirit every day